to the church family. Uh, tickled to death to have Debbie here because I've been praying and praying for somebody to keep that daughter of her straight. So, <laughs> see, she knew right away. She knew. I didn't even have to say anything else. So, all right. They, uh, but it is good to be in the house of the Lord together tonight. Amen. Um, we, uh, the seniors are going to be, uh, choir is going to come and sing here in just a moment. Uh, but I'm going to get out of their way here in just a second. Uh, we're going to have a word of prayer. Uh, and uh, want to ask for uh, some special prayers uh, for a couple of people. Uh, Miss Vicki Snipes, thank you again for your, the offering today. Uh, I have no idea how much it was. We'll announce that next week after we take up the second offering. Uh, but it, well, it looked like, as always, this, uh, the church was generous. Uh, continue to pray for Vicki. Uh, she goes... Tuesday, I think, to have a bone marrow scan and stuff done. Uh, Mary has surgery in the morning for a hernia operation. We want to continue to lift her up and pray for her. Miss Joyce Jackson is having a procedure done on her back this week on the 11th. We want to continue to pray for her and lift her up. Uh, we have a celebrity in our midst, uh, Mr. Jim King back there, and his family will be traveling to Washington, D.C. this weekend. Right, Jim? And where he will be recognized among with other uh, law enforcement officers around our nation as a trooper of the year. Again, congratulations, Jim. We're very proud of you and thank you for the job that you do and for your precious family. Uh, and we want to also remember Miss Tina Minshew. I just found out tonight, Ronnie has told the folks and everything, Miss Tina is going to have surgery Wednesday uh, for a mass in her colon. Uh, so be praying uh, for Miss Tina Minshew. Be lifting her up in your prayers uh, as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer then at this time. Christ, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Miss. Ann, I, I knew there was somebody else. Ann and Larry also continues to need prayer as well. He's still having problems with his lungs. Yeah, uh, Rob told me that. Steve Grant as well. Yeah, and Ann Johnson's having surgery this week as well, isn't she? So, uh, for... Uh, cancer in her tongue uh, and throat. So, uh, all right, let's go to the Lord in prayer then. Christ Jesus, you've heard these particular needs. And Lord, uh, there are many particular needs. We know that. Lord, uh, you are faithful to answer the call for all of these prayer concerns. Uh, Christ Jesus, again, we thank you for uh, the most particular need that you have met, and that is every individual soul when you died on Calvary's cross for our sins, Christ Jesus, uh, to bring salvation and grace unto uh, the world. Lord, we pray for these names that we have lifted up tonight. We pray for each and every one of them. We pray for their precious families, Lord, that you will bless their families. Uh, and, uh, Lord, that you will take and be in complete control, Lord. We give you uh, the glory and the honor for all of it, Lord. We've, uh, we've talked about a couple of uh, uh, different surgeries and um, procedures and things that are going uh, to happen this week. Lord, we know that your hands... Lord, are the hands that will guide uh, those surgeons, that will guide the technicians and the rest. And so we pray for all of those folks, Lord, uh, and those needs. We pray for our precious brothers and sisters uh, who uh, very much, Lord, have given a life of service unto you. And yet, Lord, we also know uh, that until uh, that last call. We also know until, Lord Jesus, that, that you put death and hell under your feet. We know the Lord, there will be trials, there will be sufferings in this life. And so, Lord, we turn to you uh, that we may be able to faithfully hold on to your hand, uh, Lord, and that you will guide us through those. Lord, there are other needs that have not been stated tonight. And yet, Lord, we know that you are those there in those needs as well. Uh, Lord, I'm praying for our families and for our fathers and mothers. And Lord, I'm praying for relationships. And Lord, I'm praying... Uh, for a, a world that is uh, free uh, from uh, these suspicions and problems that uh, we so often deal with. Uh, Christ Jesus, I, I pray that we turn to you, and Lord, in your grace uh, and in that knowledge that we come again to that uh, loving uh, knowledge of just how much you love us, just how much you care for us. Lord, I thank you for a conversation that I had with a young man tonight that loves you very much, Lord, and he very much wants to share that with the whole world. 
And Lord, we'll look forward to that timetable that you have set before him. And Lord, we just pray uh, that you would just uh, be with him. And thank you for that encouragement, uh, Lord, of a father that uh, was there beside him and, and encouraged him uh, in that conversation. Christ Jesus, I pray that you'll just uh, take it and watch over the choir now as they sing. As we praise your holy name, as we lift you up in all things, we'll give you the glory and the honor for it all, Christ Jesus, in your precious and holy name. Amen. Brother Hal, come lead your choir. Let the Lord.
having some surgery tomorrow as well. So, our Bible, first, uh, excuse me, Second Peter. We just finished up First Peter, Second Peter, uh, tonight, chapter one. A wonderful uh, little book. Again, this is uh, if you uh, are familiar with the, and most of us are familiar with Paul and his letters, and, and when Paul is writing to First Timothy. Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. We're familiar with those words. Well, this is kind of Peter's uh, letter, his last letter. He is getting ready uh, to go uh, and doing that. He, it is a little different than the first letter. The first letter, the, uh, the take is... Uh, the language is a little more refined, and some people say, well, uh, both men didn't write these. Well, uh, only an ignorant person would say that. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, this is, a, this is some liberal person trying to pick apart God's word. Uh, and so, I want you to turn to Second Peter, but if you'll flip back uh, one page to First Peter, uh, you can see the reason for the difference. Uh, because uh, Peter writes... In, sec, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12, By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly. And so, Peter is using a amanuensis. That's a fancy word for secretary. Uh, to take and write down his words. And, and Silvanus obviously is an educated uh, Greek. Uh, many Romans use the Greeks as tutors and teachers for their children and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, Silvanus wrote this letter, a faithful brother wrote this letter for Peter. Peter was not a learned man. We see in the book of Acts uh, that the, uh, when he stands before the Sanhedrin, they took note of that. He is not a, a learned man. He's not educated. And yet they were amazed by his answers that were given uh, through the Holy Spirit. So follow with me in 2 Peter for just a second. You'll find that the language is a little more direct in 2 Peter. In 2 Peter, Sylvanus doesn't uh, help write uh, this one. Uh, it is uh, more out of Peter's own hand. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and therefore it has not been if you will, dressed up a little bit uh, with the, in the Greek. Uh, the Greek's a little rougher, uh, and, it's, uh, and so it's uh, more directly from Peter. Both of these are under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We find some tremendous verses of Scripture about the writing of, of Scripture in Second Peter. Uh, and doing that, we're only going to be looking at the first 11 verses tonight. Uh, read with me, if you will. I, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and be, peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and, our, and of Jesus our Lord. Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren giving diligence to make sure your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto, into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus, we ask your blessing upon the reading of your words. Stir our hearts tonight. Lift us up. Touch us. We ask it, Christ Jesus, in your precious and holy name that we would be the Christian that you would have us to be, showing our lives in faith in the world about us. We ask it, Christ, in your name. Amen. 
Amen. We're going to touch on just a few themes here tonight. Uh, I'll tell you the truth of the matter is that Peter is writing from experience. He's writing from these things that he knows. He is writing not as he's not giving some kind of treatise or theological theological theory or, or anything like that. He is writing from life experience. Peter is the one who who uh, made the great confession that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. He, just a few moments later, is rebuked uh, by Jesus Christ when Jesus tells him, Get thee behind me, Satan. Yes, it was Peter that that was said to. It's Peter who says, I will never fail you. I will die for you. And as Jesus has said before the cock crows twice, you would deny me three times. He fails miserably in that. It is Peter who is restored on the seashore when Jesus three times says, Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs, feed my flock, feed my sheep. Peter becomes a great preacher of Pentecost. This unlearned man, he is beaten for Christ. He becomes the apostle to the Jews as Paul becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. And yet, see, it's too easy to take him and, and, and put people in these boxes and put these labels and these names on them uh, that we often do. It is Peter who speaks to Cornelius in the book of Acts. It is Peter who said that, a no, uh, that receives the message that no man is unclean. It is Peter who stands up at the, uh, the council uh, and, and speaks for Paul and the others uh, in Acts chapter 15. It is Peter who is uh, going to go to Rome, the, the head, the territory, the capital of the Gentile world. It is Peter that is going to be crucified for his faith outside of the city of Rome. Peter knows exactly what he's talking about, folks. He's been through it. He has lived that life experience. I love to hear the stories of Christians and their lives. I, one of my favorite pastimes is to read church history and to read the lives of old saints and old missionaries uh, 200, 300, 400 years ago, the difficulties, the trials and stuff that they went through. We talk about William Carey. How many of you are familiar? Uh, you may not know what he did, but maybe you've heard that name before. William Carey, you've heard that name before? Oh, shame on you if you say no. We call William Carey the father of modern missions. It was William Carey, that little old shoemaker, uh, who, who again wasn't a learned man and everything, but had such a zeal and a desire to go to India to take and translate the scriptures into their languages and, and, and to take and, and, and raise funds and raise monies. It was William Carey uh, that carries off so many, and we have all those that come behind him, Adoniram Judson and so on and so forth, and uh, uh, down to, to the present and modern age. It was William Carey who preached on the continent of India 14 years before he saw his first convert. 14 years. I was, uh, uh, here's a name I know that you know. How many of y'all know who Adrian Rogers is? Oh, we know Adrian. Adrian's still on the radio. You see him on television. Powerful preacher. Powerful, powerful preacher. Charles Spurgeon has been called the prince of preachers. Uh, and, and, and you know, uh, we were talking uh, the other day, I was talking with some other pastor friends of mine and everything, and, and we were talking about these young men that come out of school uh, and, and everything, and every one of them, they, they're going to have a ministry like Charles Spurgeon or like Adrian Rogers and everything, and every one of them are going to just walk through the doors of a church of 20,000 people and say, oh, please, God, hallelujah, you've sent us a preacher. But we don't look at what these men paid and the price that they paid for God to take and give them the responsibilities that they've gotten. Well, folks, I could just stop right here now in 2 Peter and we can just go back to the, the story of the talents. <laughs> and the uh, fact of the matter is that you, you, how many of you know how Adrian Rogers got his start? Adrian Rogers' first church had about 30 people in it. It was down in Florida, mid-Florida. Every, every Sunday, they gave Adrian Rogers $30 to go and preach in that church. Every Sunday. 
He had to drive 300 miles, 150 miles each way, 300 miles every Sunday to go and preach in that church. There was no gas money, no meal money, no, that's it. That's it. They gave him $30. That's it. To go and preach the gospel in that little old church of about 30 people. Well, he went on to be a, a world famous radio, television, Bible preacher and everything in Bellevue Church in Memphis, Tennessee uh, with a membership of close to 20,000 people. But folks, God honored that work. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, I hate to do this, this is going to be sound so proud and so boastful and everything, but I wouldn't trade any church on this planet for Pioneer and Baptist Church because I love this church and God has called me to be here. And this is exactly where I want to be. And I'm thankful for that. And Peter knew exactly who he was and where he was supposed to be at. And that's why Peter says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter doesn't give out a resume. He doesn't start talking about uh, his diplomas and all this. This is his resume. Servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. To them, and this is funny, I, I don't understand some of these commentaries you'd look through sometimes. And let me again remind you, there's nothing wrong with the commentary. Uh, they can be very helpful, but they are not God's word. The greatest commentary you can find on the Bible is the Bible. They are not God's word. And I read in a commentary the other day, I was looking at this, about how Peter was writing uh, to Jews. And I'm like, man, you've got to be as ignorant as a fish to get that out of them scriptures. He says to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Folks, you can't get any more Christian than that. Like precious faith. And so Peter is writing to the Christian and then he says to them, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. And by the way, this is one of the hallmarks of Peter's introduction. We see in 1 Peter chapter 1, in the 1 Peter, he writes to them, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And in verse 2 he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctifying of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. It's the same greeting. It's the same man that is writing this. And then Peter goes on, if you will, this is his fruits of the spirit list. As Paul has his in Galatians chapter 5, so Peter has his fruits of the spirit list. But Peter takes and he talks about growing from grace unto grace. He talks about growing in the knowledge of the Lord. According to his, as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, I want you to understand that and don't leave that. Don't leave that when we go to start talking about the rest of these things. Because uh, what, what he does is he starts giving building blocks. In, verse, uh, in, in, the, in building blocks, in verse 5, he talks about faith and virtue. Virtue, knowledge. Knowledge, temperance. These are building blocks. You, you get one and it helps build the other one. But let me tell you something. Don't leave this, not this phrase right here uh, that his divine power hath given unto us. You see, you don't go out and get those things yourself. God gives you those things. You all know where faith comes from? People, people talk about, well, if you just have enough faith, God will take care of this. If you just have enough faith, your child will get well. If you just have enough faith, you'll, uh, he'll pay all your bills. If you just have enough faith, faith doesn't come from what you believe. If I believe, I believe. You're, you're not the little engine that could. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. That's not faith. Faith comes from God, folks. God gives faith. And as we are tested in our faith, and, it, and then, then God takes and continues to measure out those gifts in that faith. And the same thing is true in these virtues, if you will, in these, in these graces as they have been called uh, from time to time. He says, whereby are given unto us. These things are given unto us. 
exceedingly great and precious promises that by these things you might be partakers of the divine nature. I've actually underlined that phrase, partakers of the divine nature in my Bible. Because he talks about this later on in verse 9, but he that lacks these things is blind. Folks, there's a reason there's a reason why some Christians never receive joy. There's a reason why some Christians, so-called Christians, well, I'm not going to call them so-called Christians, but I, there's a reason why some Christians never, never are happy. There's a reason why some Christians never seem to just make it over the hump. There's a reason why. It's because they never exercise these the gifts that they are given. And if you don't exercise a gift... Pretty soon you lose it. How many talented ball players? This is, you know, uh, every coach in America will tell you that the saddest world, word in the sports world is the word potential. They have the potential to be the next Hank Aaron. They have the potential to be the next uh, Tom Brady. They have the potential to be the next Michael Jordan. How many, how many kids have you seen that had that potential and Nothing ever came of it. Folks, you have to exercise those gifts that you are given. And as you exercise those, those gifts that you, I, I'll remind you again, uh, most of you already know this, Michael Jordan, uh, proclaimed by most, including myself, the greatest basketball player in NBA history. And by the way, I stopped watching after he retired. Anyhow, I don't care anything about that stupid sport. But they, uh, that's just my opinion. I'll stick to it. Uh, they, uh, uh, but, the, but the fact of the matter is that uh, y'all know he was cut from his junior high base, uh, basketball team. He wasn't even good enough to play junior high basketball. Tom Brady drafted in the last round. Mike Piazza, catcher for the Dodgers. Drafted, I think, I forget exactly what that was, like 600 or something like that, just to make Tommy Lasorda happy, Hall of Famer. You see, you can't... You can't measure success after potential, but they kept at it, they kept at it, they kept at it, they kept at it. They took their gifts and they exercised these gifts that they might be partakers of the divine nature. I know uh, Peter knows exactly what he's talking about because I gave him that great big buildup at the beginning talking about what an ignorant and unlearned man he was. He was just an old common fisherman. He wasn't anybody except a man that was going to change the face of the entire world because he was faithful to Jesus Christ. What about you? Are you going to be a person that changes your world because, just because you're faithful to Jesus Christ, because you exercise your gifts, exercise those things? He says, he says, partakers of the divine nature, they, here's the first gift that you get. You may not see this, but read with me. The first gift you get is having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The first gift that you get is the recognition that I'm a sinner and that through Jesus Christ I can escape sin. How many of you are thankful that you are forgiven of your sins? Or how many of you actually do this? Well, I sin again, uh, Jesus. I, I'm going to need you to go ahead and take care of that one for me, will you? So I can go on back tomorrow and do the same thing over again. You go ahead and do that one. You, you, well, well, I'm not perfect. You know, Lord, you, you go ahead and take care of that one for me. Be thankful that you're not in your sins anymore. Stay out of them. Paul says, why should we sin more that grace may abound? God forbid. You're not proving the power of God by sinning more. You're proving the power of sin over your life. Because Jesus Christ is already taking care of sin. Let him do it. That's the first gift that he's given it. And he says, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. That's what I was just talking about. You know your faith has saved you from your sins. Virtue means goodness. Now that you're saved from your sins, you no longer do sin, you do good. And from your virtue, knowledge. 
Now, what we want to do a lot of times is we want to take and, and give everybody a big quiz and everything and see if they pass the big Sunday school quiz so that they can be saved. By the way, that quiz isn't in the Bible. That, that quiz consists basically of this. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins? Do you believe that he rose on the third day? Look at Romans chapter 10. Those who confess with their mouth and believe with their heart, call upon the Lord, shall be saved. But we want to do it the hard way. We're kind of like the old joke about the three guys that show up to heaven and first guy's getting ready, he knocks on the gate and he gets ready to go in and, and Peter said, ho, 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 wait a minute. You know, old Peter, he's the gatekeeper up there at heaven. That's what the old stories say, right? Hold on a minute, you got to take the test. Test, I didn't know there was a test. Oh yeah, don't worry about it. So he, said, he says, spell God, G-O-D. Woo, the angels sing, the gates open, come on in, my friend. Next guy, he sees this going on. He said, oh, you got to take a test. Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, well, what's the test? He says, spell God. G-O-D. Boo, the angels sing, the gates open, spell man. James Orr walks up there. I saw the other two do this. They say, all right, man, give me the test. He looks at me, he says, spell chrysanthemum. <laughs> but that's not the way heaven works, folks. Heaven doesn't work by spelling anything. But J-E-S-U-S. -S, Jesus. There is no other way. Jesus. And so, but, but we should add knowledge to our goodness. As mature Christians, we should take and know why we're saved and, and how we're saved and, and the virtues of being saved. And then, and then from knowledge, temperance. And temperance means self-control. I don't have to do those things anymore because I now have the knowledge to know that what those things pay off to me, what they do, self-control, and from self-control, from temperance to patience, the ability to persevere, to carry it on, to take and follow on Paul's words, I have finished the race. And from patience to godliness, that's what finishing the race means, doesn't it? come into the presence of God. Godliness, brotherly kindness. And brotherly kindness leads to love. Leads to love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I told you that story this morning about the king who had set in a pardon and at the end the young man didn't fulfill his mission and so he's asking, what's the king going to say? What's the king going to say? Let me tell you something, folks. If you will do these things, if you will continue to exercise the gifts that has given, God has given it to you, if you will continue to grow in those gifts, God will add more gifts to you and you can't help but be fruitful for the Lord. And being fruitful fruitful that means that you're going to add to his kingdom you're going to take an add to his reputation you're going to take an add to his grace in other peoples they're going to look at you going to say I want what you have I need what you have in my life I'm going through a hard time I need a brother or sister that I can depend upon this this means you will not be barren you will not be unfruitful. You know what barren means, right? It means not able to bear a child, not able to reproduce. Jesus said, take the barren tree and cut it down. Peter says it this way. He that lacks these things, he that doesn't do these things is blind. And cannot see far off. Literally, he can't see past the day that he is in. Short-sighted. I don't see the big picture. I don't see heaven. I don't see anything. All I can see is what I can get out of today. And folks, there are a lot of people that join the church just for that reason. I told you when I was with Family Dollar, uh, in the manual for the managers. I was a manager for the man. Join the biggest church in town. It's good for business. It was right there in the manual. There are a lot of people that do that. Insurance salesmen and car salesmen and stuff like that. You got your whole audience full of people. Right there every Sunday. 
make those contacts. That's my friends. That's my buddies. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being an insurance salesman or being a car salesman, but there is something wrong if that's your motive. If that's the only reason you're there. They have forgotten. Now look at this. Verse 9 says, And they have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. It does not mean that they are lost. It means they've forgotten that they've gotten saved. <laughs> there is a difference. How many of you, I've got one, I might have a couple, I might be the one. How many of you got a family member that everybody in the family is like, oh. Couldn't you be a family member in somebody else's family? <laughs> How many of you got a family member like that? But that's the way some of these Christians are. They've forgotten that they're part of the family. They're forgotten. They've forgotten just how important Jesus Christ is and what he has done for them. And they still act like they're part of the old family, part of the old world, part of the life that they came out. They've forgotten uh, that they were purged from their old sins. And I'll tell you what happens when a person acts like that and they have forgotten that. They forget about other people that need to see Christ too. They forget about the salvation picture altogether. I was sharing a... a Sharing with Jeff a while ago, uh, I've got a pastor friend of mine this week. It's been, we've been friends for many, many, many years. And, and uh, he's actually been at it about five years longer. He's been in ministry about 30 years. And I've talked to him three times in the past two weeks. And he said, man, I'm ready to pack it in. I'm ready to quit. I've had enough. Now, he's, he's not old. He's not done. He's not worn out. But he is tired of getting beat up. He's got a head of his building and grounds committee. The church needs some work on it. This is a large church. Multi-million dollar complex. But the chairman of the building and grounds committee wants to control everything. Here's the problem with the chairman of the building's ground committee. Happens to be a woman in this case. That's not really important, man or a woman. That person has not stepped foot in that church in 18 months. I'm like, Bo, <laughs> he said, I can't do anything about it. They won't let her go. Because she's related to some other family members in the church that has some authority, some power, and some money. So the rest of the church, I said, man, you have got to get rid of that. That's a cancer in the church. That person is not spiritually prepared to do anything for God's house. That's what he's talking about. This is the kind of person he's talking about. They've forgotten that they knew Jesus Christ. They've forgotten that they came out of their sins. They've forgotten that they were a sinner and needed grace. And now they think that they're in control. And let me tell you something, Christian. When you think that you're in control instead of Jesus Christ, you've lost control. Satan's in control now. You've got to get rid of that stuff. He says, therefore, rather brothers, sisters, brethren, family, give diligence. Make sure of your calling and election. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. John tells us that these things are written that you may know that you are saved. I'm, I'm tired of people that come up. These are church people and other uh, uh, and, and that come up and say, well, I don't know if I'm saved or not. Well, let me tell you something. It's not God's fault and it's not God's word's fault that you don't know that you're saved. It's your fault. You haven't taken and checked with God. You haven't checked with his word. You haven't made sure and been diligent about your own salvation. God's word is here to show you that you're saved. You shall never fall if you make sure you're calling and your election. How do we do that? We'll go back to that list again. Giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, or goodness, and to your goodness, the knowledge of God, and on and on, patience, long-suffering. Do those things which are necessary. 
Work out your faith in fear and trembling. Work out your salvation. For so an entrance shall be ministered. That, that means supplied. Be given again to you. Over and over again, Peter talks about these things that are given to us, given to us, given to us, given to us. He knows. He's been the recipient of these things in his life. All over and over again, these things that you know these things have been given unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I love the fact that Peter Pipe puts in there abundantly because, folks, nobody knows like Peter does that God doesn't do anything halfway. He is going to give you everything you need in order to carry out the mission that he has put before you. I made mention tonight our prayer request about Miss Tina Minshew and everything. I, some of you already knew. Some of you suspected something was going on. And Tina didn't want to say anything. Though. She doesn't like a lot of attention on herself. Y'all know that. Tina's been with this church forever. Her and her family. Precious. Precious brothers and sisters. But you know what she was really concerned about tonight? Or today? Why she didn't say anything? Because of Vicki. Miss Vicki Snipes. We were doing a love offering. She didn't want to take anything away from that. Folks, that's a true brother or sister right there. That's a true heart for Jesus Christ. That's a person that cares about other people. That's a lifetime of experience and love and grace showered out and shared out. And folks, that's a lady and that's a family that's put their lives into all of our lives. Just as we put our lives into each other's lives. And that's what Peter's talking about. Don't, don't forget, we all had to start from somewhere. Don't forget where your salvation started from. Don't forget that you were lost and now are found. Don't forget those things. I made mention about those people down at the river this morning and how when I sang Amazing Grace, they all hid their beers behind their hands and uh, behind their backs. And it was funny. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I, I thought it was real funny. I was trying not to laugh. But that doesn't mean that God didn't love those people. That meant there was an opportunity to share that love of God with those people. Amen? That doesn't mean I needed to act like them. It didn't mean I needed to go grab a beer from one of them. But before I left, I had one fellow talk to me. He said, you know, I, I, I like you. I need to probably come check you out. Now he's already about three sheets to the wind. I need to come check you out. Will you take a drinker in your church? He's got that beer in his hand. I said, buddy, we'll take a drinker. But you'll have to leave that beer outside. You'll have to leave that drink outside. Now I'm going to tell you what. I've said this before and I'll say this again. I'm not going, I don't want to get off on a tangent on this and everything. It's not really making the point. But you can't share the gospel with a drunk. Either they'll forget what you said the next day. Or they'll fight with you about it the whole time. But that drunk's not drunk all the time. And that drunk knows they need something in their life beside that beer. That's why they keep drinking it because it never satisfies them. Never fills them up. And that's why I don't need a beer or anything else because I've got Jesus. But folks, don't forget that. When Peter is writing to these folks, he is reminding them of that. Hold on to the truth of the gospel that is in Jesus Christ. And you're going to see in the rest of this letter just how adamant he is about this. Just how serious he is about this. Of holding on to the truth of Jesus Christ. Because that is the point that changes the world. This poor old ignorant fisherman that know better about nothing. Except knew that if he was faithful to the Lord that the Lord would change the world all around him and he did and folks that's what he's going to do around us too if we'll be faithful he will change the world around us amen 
Christ Jesus, we thank you so much for your grace. And Lord, I thank you. You've changed my world. My world is not what it was. I still recognize that old world. I still remember that old world that I came out of. I remember growing up in a home that didn't know Jesus. And I remember a home that found Jesus. And that way I remember a home that changed completely. And Lord, I'm thankful that I now serve in a home that loves Jesus. And not just a home that out on the farm, but this home right here. This house, your home. And Lord Jesus, that home that lives in my heart where you reside with me, Holy Spirit. Christ Jesus, be with us today and in the days ahead. And Lord, help us to reach out and to touch those that need you. And Lord, to know your grace, to know the fullness of your grace, and to be touched in our hearts and lives so that we can touch the hearts of lives of others because we remember the change that was brought over us. And Lord Jesus, we'll give you the glory and the honor for all of these things. For we ask it, Christ, in your name. Amen. God bless you, folks. Have a great week. Senior, see you in the morning at, at 9 o'clock for Camp Pine Hill.